Hello and welcome to Our Professor Podcast. I'm Micah Sander. I'm Carter Green. And in this episode, we spoke with Professor Benjamin Karp. Professor Ben Karp is the Daniel M. Lyons Professor of American History at Brooklyn College. He received his BA from Yale and his MA and PhD from the University of Virginia. He is the author of Defiance of the Patriots, The Boston Tea Party and the Making of America, and Rebels Rising, Cities in the American Revolution. And his new book, The Great New York Fire of 1776, A Lost Story of the American Revolution. He has written about nationalism, firefighters, wet nurses, Benjamin Franklin, and Quaker merchants in Charleston for scholarly journals like Early American Studies, Civil War History, New York History, the William and Mary Quarterly, and popular publications such as BBC History, Colonial Williamsburg, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post. To talk to us about Professor Karp, we have a student who wrote a phenomenal article about him and his book in Brooklyn College's school paper, The Vanguard. Uh, we have today with us Paulina. Paulina, thank you for being here. Welcome. Thank you for having me. What is it like taking a class with Professor Karp? Um, so the first class that I took with Professor Karp was last semester, and it was his Revolutionary Generation class. And it's just so rewarding to have a professor that's so passionate about the things that they study. I didn't really see myself looking into American history, history of the American Revolution. But his class is was just amazing. The way that it's structured, if you've ever taken a class with Benjamin Karp, is that he has like this research project that you do throughout the entire semester. And he frames it around that. And so it's great because it allowed us to, you know, learn how to research, learn how to look through archives, learn how to write research papers. And also, you know, he was helping us along every step of the way. Also, you know, I feel like when we look at American history, we look at it from this viewpoint of just the 13 colonies, just the war, the 13 colonies. But the readings that we did in Professor Karp's class, they were just chosen so well because we got to look at the war from different points of view, from what was it like for slaves during the war? What was it like for people in the Gulf Coast, right? What was it like for people in Canada? What was it like for women? And so, you know, it's just, yeah, it was just very rewarding. And even now, even though I'm not in his class currently, if I ever have a question or if I need recommendations for anything, books that I want to read about the topic, you know, he's always like very quick to reach out and he just, he's very passionate about what he does. So, yeah. You mentioned uh, the the big research paper. I know a lot of people that are prospective students would be curious to know what what kind of workload that he has for the class, uh, what kind of learning structure is behind it all. Okay, so basically the class was, like any history class, there's readings that we have, and we would have to submit reading responses before each class about the readings. And then the research paper, there's four parts to it. And so the first part is that we get to basically pick our topic and then the next part is that we do um, an, an annotated bibliography and then we write the third part and then the fourth part is we put everything together so that's basically the gist of most of his classes I think that he does these research projects for every single one of his classes too well without further ado I think we can just get right to the interview everybody please give a gigantic welcome to Professor Ben Carp yay Thank you so much, Professor Karp, for being here today. Thank you for um, having me. I'm excited. So we'll start with asking, why did you choose this area of study? Did it change? And was there a particularly important professor or mentor at any stage of your education? Yeah, this is a story I've told a lot of times before. So my father, a CUNY educated, uh, was, a, was a high school social studies teacher. And so when I went to college, I was like, well, I don't want to necessarily be a history major. You know, my, you know, I grew up in a house filled with history books. You know, if I do that, everyone will say, because I was the oldest son, right? They, everyone would say, well, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I went into college looking for the most flexibility uh, that I could. And in my freshman year, I took classes in philosophy, in political theory, in literature, in political science, in economics in math, every even in math, you know, multivariable calculus, biggest mistake of my undergraduate career. So I took everything except history, uh, you know, because I, you know, what are the different ways of understanding about the world? What are the different ways of thinking? And then in the, my, the first semester of my sophomore year was when I finally, you know, started taking history classes. And the course I took was with a, a colonial history professor named John Demos, 
who taught the colonial period of American history. And I remember the assignment that made me into a history major. He told us to go into the library and look at these bound copies of the Essex County, Massachusetts court records from the 1600s. And all he gave us was either the name of a crime or the name of a person. And, and you just had to go and like look in the index, find different mentions of that crime or person and begin telling your own story about what you were seeing in those court records that was significant to you. And so to me, that direct interaction with primary sources and being able to draw my own interpretive conclusions was so thrilling to me that I was like, okay, history is the way that I want to think about the world. And I was already kind of hooked with this period and very rapidly, you know, kind of came to specialize in it. You know, and then as far as wanting to go on to graduate school, it was actually another course with Demos. He taught a course on the social history of the American Revolution. And we read this article about a, a, a diminutive shoemaker in Boston, you know, who was there at the Boston Massacre, was, you know, helping, you know, dump tea into the harbor at the Boston Tea Party, was involved in another uh, fracas that led to a man being tarred and feathered. And, and the author of this a scholar named Alfred Young said, you know, before the revolutionary movement, this shoemaker, his name was George Robert Twelves Hughes. This shoemaker, uh, you know, wasn't very involved in civic life, unlike his brother and unlike Ebenezer McIntosh. He wasn't a firefighter. And I said, hold up, what did it mean if you were a firefighter during the American Revolution? Uh, and then I was kind of off and running and I wrote a bad junior seminar paper on that, uh, but then wrote a pretty good uh, senior thesis on firefighters and the American Revolution. And, and so that was when I was like, okay, I'm hooked. I've, uh, I've talked to people about law school. I've interned at a, a publishing house. I've done some college journalism. I even worked on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange for a summer. I, I know a lot about the different careers I don't want to do, uh, but being <laughs> able to, uh, to muck around and continue to do history, that's, that's what I'd really like to do. And interestingly, Demos was not really a one-on-one -on -one mentor for me uh, so much. It was it was David Wallstreicher, who now teaches at the CUNY Graduate Center, and a, and a religious history scholar named uh, John Butler, who actually wrote a book called God in Gotham, who were two of my most important mentors uh, as an undergraduate. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah, wow. That's a, that, so, yeah, that's a good story. Sorry. Yeah. But, no, that, that, yeah many that, times. That, that's so interesting. Yeah. And I want to take those classes now. Yeah. I mean, Butler's course, he taught religion in modern America, which actually is is the, the whenever someone asks, like, what was the most, what was the course you took as an undergraduate that changed your way of thinking about the world? And it was religion in modern America. Because I used to joke that I never met a Protestant until I went to college. Uh, you know, I grew up <laughs> in a neighborhood on Long Island where everyone who wasn't Jewish was Catholic pretty much. And it's not actually true, but, you know, but then, you know, I went to, I went to college, which had, you know, been founded as a place to train Protestant ministers in the first place. And, and I took this course on religion in modern America, where we read William James, we read, you know, about black religious history, Jewish, uh, we read the Madonna of 115th street about Italian Catholics in what's now Spanish Harlem. You know, we read all this uh, really interesting work. We read about uh, satanic ritual abuse. We read about uh, new age religion. We read about spiritualism. We read, you know, all this other stuff a and learning just the way religion shapes Americans thinking to such a profound degree was not something that I had really grown up with, but that I, I really came to kind of understand in a profound new way. And I, I still dabble in religious history now, now and again, it's not what I primarily do. But yeah, I mean, again, you know, these are the things that, you know, the, that were that were transformative for, for me when I was an undergraduate student. There are those out there that like to use the American Revolution as a time of just simple black and white tyranny versus liberty in American history. The founding fathers are presented as all-knowing, infallible, like just make it very neat and tidy, scrape all their skeletons under the rug. I'm thinking specifically something like Trump's 1776 commission. How does your latest book on New York's Great Fire demonstrate the true complexity of this period in the nation's history? When I talk to audiences, I sometimes use a phrase that I've borrowed from uh, from Jan Lewis, who is a professor at Rutgers and an administrator at Rutgers Newark. Uh, she died a number of years ago. But she, in a review, I think she once called like a, a certain version of the American Revolution, the bedtime story of the American Revolution, right? That it was these great founders in their knee breeches signing the Declaration of Independence, you know, or the suffering soldiers in the snow at Valley Forge, you know, and that if we want to think about the 
the great ideals or the you know or the soldierly heroism you know of the uh, of the men of that generation that's that that's the only story that we need to know but the truth is the story of the revolution is so much richer you know if you also look at it from the perspective of loyalists hessian soldiers british soldiers women native americans african americans if you if you look at the story of the revolutionary war how it looks in india in europe in the caribbean right you get this you know such a fuller richer picture uh, of the revolutionary experience and i don't think it does us a disservice to kind of say like hey sometimes the revolution involved you know, really serious violence and atrocity, right? Like we like to say, oh, our revolution wasn't like the French revolution or the Russian revolution or the Chinese revolution. Uh, but instead, you know, it still was a civil war, right? And, you, you know, and so for us to be able to take these different perspectives, take the British perspective on it, learn uh, about some more complexity, maybe raise the idea that George Washington had ordered the burning of New York City and kind of take him down from his pedestal a little bit. I don't think that's such a bad thing. I, I You know, to have a more mature uh, understanding of the revolution, I, I think, just allows us a deeper appreciation uh, of it. I know um, it, I had sort of middle school, high school, elementary school, I had gotten a lot of that bedtime narrative. And so it had, it had made me really disinterested in American revolutionary history. And it wasn't honestly until going to your your book talk for this book that I it sort of renewed my interest and I definitely want to read read it and look at this period again. I never had even thought of it as a civil war until your lecture. Yeah, it's funny. The first historians of the revolution always referred to it as a civil war. You know, they knew, you know, they they knew that there were families that were torn apart and, you know, parents and children who never saw each other again uh, because, you, you know, the loyalists, some of the loyalists went into exile. Yeah, it's funny. You know, I mean, I know why we teach the revolution that way in schools, right? I mean, I, you know, I grew up saying pledge allegiance to the flag every morning, right? Like it's the story of our origins. We want to emphasize unity, liberty, and equality, you know, in thinking about the origins of the American Revolution. And, um, you know, and so many of the stories kind of fall into the the same groove. And it can be it can be difficult to tell a more complex story. You know, sometimes you have to use those shaded boxes on the side of a textbook in order to have students think about alternative perspectives. And it really is a challenge, you know, even for academic historians to say, well, how can I tell a more integrated story that still gives the highlights of what we need to know, Declaration of Independence, Battle of Yorktown, what have you, while still helping people to understand like, hey, you know, not everyone was on board with this. And, you know, and there was a lot of, of, of push pull and tensions that needed to be worked out. What What's the new social hierarchy going to be? What is race going to mean in the new nation? You know, there's a lot of really interesting questions that you can ask about the revolutionary period and about the revolutionary war specifically. Before coming to Brooklyn College, you taught at the University of Edinburgh. And yeah. Scotland has a long history of rebellion and rejection of English dominance while also helping build the British Empire financially and militarily and in other ways. These kinds of dynamics could be found in American colonists' relationship to the English as well. Uh, with these somewhat conflicting factors, what was it like teaching the history of the American Revolution in Scotland or just in the UK more broadly? Yeah, I mean, to answer that question actually doesn't take me into like, you know, the history that you're talking about from, you know, let's say the Middle Ages or the early modern period, but it actually takes me to the moment when I was teaching at Edinburgh, which was in 2004, 2005. So the George W. Bush administration, right, in the midst of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. And one thing I noticed, right, uh, you know, I was there during the coverage of the 2004 election, U.S. news would lead a nightly broadcast in Britain, in a way that you can't imagine in the US, right, like a foreign election, like being the, the lead story on a given night. And so my students, right, who were a mix, uh, you know, of British and, and actually some, you know, non British students, they, they were looking at the United States as this global superpower. Some of them were, you know, kind of, you know, shocked by the cowboy nature of George W. Bush and his, his administration. They were sort of fascinated by the United States and wondering, right, like, how did it achieve its predominance? What made the United States tick? And so for them, you know, understanding something about the origins of the American Revolution was something that I think they felt was pretty important, right? You could, you know, you could do an American history track at Edinburgh. Um, I mean, you could certainly do plenty of Scottish history, you know, in, in the school of history and classics too. Um, but yeah, there was definitely, they were definitely not uninterested in various parts of American history. There were about five American history faculty at Edinburgh when I was there. 
So yeah, it was an interesting place to teach American history for sure. You know, there are people who make kind of, you know, superficial comparisons uh, between Scottish and American history, but really I got the sense that they were kind of interested in American history on its own terms. And it's a beautiful city too. Yeah, yeah. I was in a, a nice office in an ugly building in a beautiful city in a country that I realized I, I didn't, I couldn't really live in forever. Curious before we ask the next question, how many people at Edinburgh love stories of John Paul Jones from American Revolution? Yeah, I, I can't remember whether that uh, whether that came up or not. I mean, you're talking about, you know, long ago memory. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I don't remember talking about naval warfare. Of course, John Paul Jones, I think, makes a brief appearance in my book because of the raid on Whitehaven and, you know, Benjamin Franklin writing to him, like, burn as many English and Scottish cities as you can in retaliation for the, you know, the towns in North America that the British have burned. And nothing ended up coming of that. But yeah, I, I believe Jones makes a brief appearance in my book. For a student that has not taken a class with you and they they're curious about what the classroom is like with you how you teach your class do you have one approach to the class or does it vary depending on what you're teaching what what, what can a student look forward to when they're signing up to your classes yeah, I, I mean, I've tried to get away from canned lecturing, honestly. I, I give students, I think, a healthy amount of reading. I've been really into the idea of giving them regular reading responses, not necessarily every time, but an incentive to do a lot of them so that the students have done the reading and they come in and, and they have questions for me. And anyone who's been sitting in my classroom knows that if they ask the, the right question, I'm like a wind-up toy. You know, I just sort of start going. But, the, but, but riffing spontaneously, for some reason, I think I'm able to convey ideas better than when I have uh, prepared remarks to make. And so, uh, you know, sometimes we go in in weird directions. Sometimes we're relating things to current events or I don't know, my, my, my weird little pop culture references uh, this way or that way. But I, you know, I like doing it that way. The other thing is, is, um, you know, I mentioned before that uh, that assignment that I had done with John Demos as an undergraduate and really engaging with primary sources in that way. I really try and find ways for undergraduates at any level to have some kind of experience like that, to be able to interact with primary sources on their own and and draw their own interpretations out of them. I really try and emphasize some version of that kind of experience for any student in my classes. And now, of course, it's so much easier because so much is digitally available. So you can be in your pajamas and, you know, and, and reading original documents, you know, for, from 200 years ago, 250 years ago. So, yeah, I think it's a mix of wanting students to have an interaction with primary sources on their own, right? I have the advantage that uh, that they can read in English, uh, you know, but then also really not necessarily having them be lecture-based courses, but really trying to get discussion going, trying to have interaction, having students ask smart questions, having students make their own observations on uh, on the readings that we've done. That helps the classroom feel more dynamic to me. And so that's been the pattern. I mean, I think for students who really want a really structured approach and really want the professor kind of holding their hands and giving them the soup to nuts version of the subject, I don't know, maybe they're getting frustrated with the way that I do things. I've, I have found that that system has been working well for me over the past few years. And to me, it could be that way if I were teaching history 3401, American pluralism, uh, which I haven't been called upon to teach as much in recent years. It can be true for an intermediate 3000 level class, or it can be true uh, when I'm teaching one of the 4000 level colloquia. And I'm going to be teaching a new colloquium in the fall, which I'm really excited about, about slavery in New York. So, uh, you know, there's been all this really interesting work being done and current work being done. I mean, we already know, right, the New York City area was... Uh, heavily invested in slavery, uh, you know, and that slavery happened in the North and not just the South. That we already know. But even within that, there's just really interesting work being done by now. But like, what did gradual emancipation look like in Long Island, uh, you know, in the Hudson River Valley, in New York City itself? You know, wh what was the experience of the enslaved like? Many different dimensions of that. And to be you know, how, how are um, historical sites in the area reinterpreting, you know, some fancy 18th century house by uh, by kind of having this newfound appreciation? Well, oh, actually, this was a household with enslaved people as well. Uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot of interesting work to be done with that. I'm still, you know, coming up with, well, what kind of primary source work can we do with that? What kind of readings are we going to do with that? But I'm really excited about that. In the past, I've taught colloquia on the history of New York City and the revolution. That worked okay. 
and I taught a, a, a course on women in early America. The first time I taught that, it was fantastic. The second time I taught it, it was on Zoom, and I don't think it, it worked quite as well. So this is my this is going to be my third colloquium topic that I've taught at Brooklyn College, and uh, I'm hoping it goes well. I think I think it'll be really exciting. Uh, I'm hoping a lot of people will have t taken classes with Professor Sengupta, for instance, who will be you know who'll come prepared to talk about slavery, and and and, and so I, I have high hopes that it'll go really well. It feels like every time that we have a conversation about your field, I, I learned something new again, like because I, I had I had largely turned away from American revolutionary history in that era. Do you find students having a similar experience in your class? Because we've all had to digest that narrative. And now coming into one of your classes, it, it's like a whole new world has opened up. Yeah, I mean, you're a thoughtful guy, right? So you're, you know, when you were in your high school classroom and, you know, and being given this version of the narrative, you know, you're perceptive enough to be like, wait a minute, I'm being fed a load of bull here. But I don't know that, you know, that every student takes that precise journey. Some of them, you know, maybe have been nodding along and being like, okay, this is what I need to know about the revolution. And then they come into my classroom and they're like, whoa, I had no idea. So again, you know, different people are going to have d different paths. I try not to assume, you know, uh, what level of familiarity. So with the revolution class, for instance, I start with like this super tiny short history of the American Revolution that gets the job done in 100 pages or so, but like is still giving a somewhat up to date version of it. And it's like, all right, now we're all on the same page. And for the rest of the semester, we're not really going to necessarily be chron chronological. Instead, we'll spend a couple of weeks delving into like, okay, let's talk about slavery in the American Revolution. Let's take another few weeks and, you know, do some other case study that, you know, that will really reveal more to us about the Native American experience and other things. So that's, so that's really what I, I try and do. New York City often takes center stage in modern discussions of America, you know, being the largest city, wealthiest city, and one of the most historically significant. However, it can be said New York influenced America much more during the 18th century. How important was New York City to the, to the Continental Congress, to the British, to the newly formed United States, to this whole period? And I would actually take it from a couple of other different directions. First is, if you visit Boston or Philadelphia, you know that those cities were important for the revolution because of the way, you know, the tourist sites that you can visit, the way those cities market themselves to tourists. But New York City, really no. I mean... You know, Manhattan only has three surviving structures from the revolutionary period. According to my predecessor at Brooklyn, Ted Burroughs, he said it was the fence around Bowling Green, St. Paul's Chapel, and the Morris Jumel Mansion. And as far as Manhattan is concerned, that's it. I mean, there are other sites in the in the outer boroughs too. But, uh, uh, you know, but be, being able to envision the revolutionary landscape in New York City, which part 18, you know, the 1800s really was only Manhattan that it's, it can be very difficult to kind of squint and be able to recapture where Washington was or where British troops moved and, you know, and things like that. You know, so so appreciating nowadays that New York City was important and had an important revolutionary story and an important 18th century story, that can be a little bit difficult to recapture. I'm involved in a project at the Gotham Center, at the Graduate Center, where they're going to be developing an app that will provide a kind of revolutionary era guide, you know, to kind of say, okay, you're standing in this spot and may even do like a visual reconstruction. So that'll be really exciting when it happens. You know, the idea that you could come to New York City and do a Revolutionary War tour. I actually know some people who do very good Revolutionary War tours of New York City. But again, it's not on the map in the same way as if you were going to visit Boston or Philadelphia or Newport or Charleston, for, for that matter, which are, have a lot of great historic pre preservation from that era. But in New York, no, we we tear it down and we build something else. So, and then the other thing, but, but, but as far as my book, I gave a, a seminar on my book at University of Southern California. And one of the professors who was from Philadelphia, he's like, what do you mean New York City was at the center of the Revolutionary War in 1776? But from the perspective of, of military strategy, it really was. I mean, after the British evacuate Boston, everybody knows that, you know, the, the British Army and Navy's next target was going to be New York City, right? New York City was going to give the British, you know, control of the mouth of the Hudson River, access to New Jersey, to Connecticut, to the Hudson River Valley, you know, to Long Island, right? Uh, you know, that was going to be its way of kind of keeping an eye on New England and then, you know, providing a beacon for loyalists to come to market and be restored to their allegiance and give, you know, and give the British Army a serious beachhead in the middle colonies. Now, things didn't end up working out that way for the British even though they took New York City with relative ease in August and September of 1776. But yeah, you ask anyone in the summer and, uh, and early fall 
1776, where's the center of the action? It was absolutely New York City. I mean, Continental Congress is meeting in Philadelphia, sure, you know, but 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 New York City was really important and has all these really interesting 18th century stories going back to the early part of the 18th century, right? The slave revolt of 1712, the supposed slave revolt of, of 1741, uh, New York City's role in the Seven Years' War, uh, smuggling, piracy, slave trading. There, there, you know, there's so many interesting things you can say about 18th century New York City. And then, of course, it has its turn as, as the nation's capital in the late 18th century as well, Washington's first inauguration, et cetera. So yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot of of stuff you can say about 18th century New York City. It, it, it probably wasn't the preeminent city, you know, uh, right away, right? Philadelphia is still outstripped it in population, you know, when when the country was first born, but then it, it goes like gangbusters, you know, and then you look at things later on, like the Erie Canal and, you, you know, and other things that helped to make New York City so central. And then, and, and then yeah, our history never looks back. In your book, The Great Fire, uh, you write, quote, in the drive to cut deals and make money, New York City tears things down or lets them rot, paves over the ruins, and builds something new with little remorse, reverence, or reflection. What are the, some of the most interesting and significant buildings or spaces in New York's history that have been destroyed? Well, I would say the first Penn Station, right? Uh, the architectural historian Vin Scully used to say, you know, one used to, uh, I can't remember the exact quote, like you used to stride into New York City like a god, now you crawl in, in like a rat. And I mean, it's been renovated now, but still it's a far cry from the beautiful station that we once had. I mean, I, I don't really have like a kind of specific beloved building that I miss, but um, I'll sometimes refer students to the movie musical On the Town, where uh, Frank Sinatra is a sailor on shore leave, I think in the 1940s. And he's got like a, a guide to New York City from 1905. And so this this cab driver, female cab driver is um, trying to pick him up and saying, come back to my place. And he's like, no, I want to see all the sites first. I want to see the Woolworth building or the Hippodrome. And she's like, what, you know, where, where are you getting this idea? They tore these things down 40 years ago, you know, uh, you know, and, and so I love thinking about it that way, that like that story of New York City continuing to kind of tear down and build new structures for, you know, for new and different purposes is, you know, as much a part of New York's history as anything. You have the the new colloquium coming. And of course, your book is out now and it's gaining a lot of popularity. What other current, not to say that you have to be already working on something, you should be able to celebrate everything you've done, but current work that you're looking forward to, things you're working on now, new classes, uh, ongoing research. What's uh what's next? Yeah, I'm I'm really at the gleam in the eye stage. Uh, uh, you know, I have a I have a few different choices of what I might work on next, and I'm uh, I'm really not sure. And every time I'm like, well, this this is the one I'm going to do. I say, uh, I don't know. You know, and you got to plan these things out ahead of time. It's like, well, if I do this project, it'll mean spending some time in the UK. If I do this other project, it'll mean driving around to you know some archives in New England. If I you know if I do this, it would be more of a think piece. But you know, what kind of archival component would I want to add? You know, am I at the stage of life where I want to do a lot of archival travel? So it's it's a little tricky. I mean, spending more time uh, with my students at Brooklyn College and the Graduate Center is, it seems like uh, it wouldn't be so bad for a couple more years. So if I if I have a little bit of a fallow period, I don't know. But I, but I know inevitably I won't. That I'll get the itch. I'll want to go back in the archives. I want to be talking about my own work at conferences again. I, I want my name to be out there, not just not because I need to be famous. I really don't. But because like you know. I, I want the graduate students who I'm working with to be able to trade on my name when I write them letters of, of reference. So I've been kind of thinking about it in that way. Um, I'm excited that I will be teaching a new course in the fall. I mean, I'm teaching History of New York City this spring and next spring, and that's a new course for me. So that, you know, that's required some of my energy as well as to, you know, uh, think of a way to teach what, what for me is a, is a brand new course, uh, but something that has to be taught at Brooklyn College every spring, either New York City history or Brooklyn history, I think for the, um, for the secondary educa and education students, maybe elementary education too. So yeah, so, uh, so there's plenty to kind of keep me busy and keep my mind, uh, mind active for sure. It's like the Aerosmith song, right? I can't say baby where I'll be in a year. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a, a year from now, I may be already embarked on on one of these exciting next projects. And I don't know, every once in a while, somebody will come to me with an idea and that I'll be like, oh, no, you know what? I will write an essay on that. I, I know I'm going to be on a panel 
at the annual meeting of the Society for Historians of the Early American Republic, their meeting in Philadelphia this summer. And I'm going to be on a panel having to do with new interpretations of loyalism during the revolution. Um, you know, the loyalists end up being ended up being important sources for my book on the New York City fire. And so that book, you know, ha has me thinking about the people who are loyal to Great Britain in, in different ways. And so that might be something I, I start exploring this summer, but we'll see. Well, so far, this has been a fantastic interview, and we're coming to our final few questions here. They're very rapid fire. First thing that pops into your head, just to get to know the man behind the professor a little more. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a favorite book? Oh, that, that's impossible. You know, I've, I've read so many. I don't have one that it's like, oh, I always return to this as a kid. But I, I've spent some time in the history lounge talking with people about about fantasy fiction, which is my favorite genre reading. Right now I'm reading uh, Babel by, uh, I can't remember the author's name. Uh, she, she's actually a, a, a graduate student at Yale. My, my The favorite series that I've been recommending is by a um, an Asian Canadian author named Fonda Lee, the Jade, Jade War trilogy or whatever it's called, like just uh, uh, amazingly cool books. Um, uh, so, you know, so that's what I've been saying is my kind of current favorite within that genre. Do you have a favorite food? Favorite food? No, like, again, like, uh, I just like <laughs> variety. I like eating different things at, at every time. I had uh, uh, last night, I had a peanut butter mousse, a slice of peanut butter mousse pie or something like that. That was delicious. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, like, for me, like anything that would be my favorite, I would just want be wanting to try something new the following week. What is, what is your favorite activity to do outside of work? Uh, well, I haven't done a lot of it lately, but I would say I would say hiking. Uh, what's your favorite thing to do in New York City? Favorite thing to do in New York City? Well, some of it is like, yeah, discovering new restaurants. I went to a great Korean place, the chicken and the cocktails that I had, you know, in, in Koreatown uh, the other day, or, you know, uh, really amazing. It's a good question. You know, it's it's hard when you're, you know, when you're a parent in New York City, you know, so much of what you're doing is sort of oriented toward what your kid is doing. Um, and so it's like, well, it's very different from the experience that I would have if I were in my teens or 20s. And I would say, oh, you know, concerts, comedy clubs, you know, all, all these other things. Uh, but you're not as focused on nightlife when you're, you know, when you're at the stage of life that I, that I'm at. I mean, New York City has uh, so many amazing possibilities. You know, it's it's a shame sometimes when it's just like, OK, I'm on the subway, I'm going to work. But, I, you know, but one thing that I was reflecting on, right, we're at the most beautiful time of year at Brooklyn College, right? The tulips and the and, and the lilacs and everything. And and one thing that I also learned to appreciate during the pandemic is the little oases of beauty that are within the concrete jungle. I think, you know, I think that's one of the things about New York City that I've that I've really learned to appreciate. And uh, the the final question of the interview, what is your favorite genre of music? Favorite genre of music? I'm I'm a classic rock guy. I mean, I you know, uh, like maybe this just shows how square I am. But like, you know, I was listening to my dad's music growing up. And so like, you know, thir 30 years out of date for for my generation, it actually took me many years to like appreciate the like 90s grunge music and hip hop that I had actually grown up with, but felt alienated from when I was a teenager. Um, so I've, I've come back to that now. But still, like, you know, if I'm going to turn on a radio station, it'll be if it's not a Met game, it's going to be 104.3. Well, thank you so much. This interview was a delight. So many great answers. It was it was a pleasure talking to you, Professor. Yeah, well, thank thanks you, you guys so much. For, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Carter. This was this was really wonderful. Thank you. Our Professor Podcast was recorded with the permission of the Brooklyn College History Department and our student interviewees. We would like to thank both the students and the faculty for their contributions.